The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! And welcome in to Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysick, my partner, Malik Hill. Already in the middle of August, football season is right around the corner at this point. We have our two big college football previews left over. We got the SEC today. And then next week, we'll got the Big Ten. Uh, we're going to talk about Hard Knocks Episode 2 with the Lions tonight. And talk about a little bit of the preseason games that happened for the NFL. Um, but we're mostly going to try to get through this college football preview because there's going to be a lot to talk about. So let's start it off with Hard Knocks Episode 2 for the Lions, uh, premiered last night. What would you think of it, Malik? As good as the first episode, a little less? What's your feelings? Uh, yeah, I think, I, think it was, I think it was even better. Nothing crazy, but I thought it was even better going into more players. Yeah. I enjoyed everything with Malcolm Rodriguez, them calling him Rodrigo. The fact that it's a it's a it's a it's alarming but also a bright spot. Right. That he's already challenging for first team uh snaps. Yeah. And just seeing how explosive he is mm-hmm. tackling and going in the hole and everything. Right. Was really cool. Uh seeing him honor St. Brown him naming all the receivers ahead of him and seeing his work ethic was fantastic. Yeah. He should be in Detroit for a long time, mm-hmm. catching a bunch of balls. And Aiden Hutchinson, just seeing him progress more, seeing him start off that preseason game just looking like the second overall pick. Yeah. They the won- way it ended was tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but as usual, Lions stuff, unfortunately. But, right. yeah, I – I enjoyed all of it. And hey, the David Blau stuff, yeah. too, which I didn't know about. Yeah. And famously, I mean, the Lions went 4-0 in the 0-16 season. So, yeah. preseason, I don't care. Uh, I just want to see progression. Uh, but, yeah, it, it was unfortunate to see the Lions lose like that. But I I, I love the show. It's great. Uh, people are talking about the Lions all over the place on social media, news outlets, like, it's cool to see. Again, the the Lions. Let's hamper expectations. They're not going to do crazy things. They're not going to be some miracle team. At least I don't think so. It would be a miracle if they won seven games. Yeah. To me, um, expect four to five. Yeah. So, but it's it's cool to see that people like the Lions. They're like they're intrigued by this franchise. They like the way they're portrayed in this show. But we got to remember at the end of the day, it is just a show. It's a drama series. They're going to make things look better than they probably will be. Um, I also enjoyed the St. Brown session. That was a cool thing to see. Um, I like, uh, again, this was just what we saw, but I liked that Jared Goff looked like he was throwing really well. And we saw it a little bit in the preseason game, too. So it's not, that's actual game time. But then, okay, uh, where were we? We were talking about hard knocks. <laughs> and we were talking about Amon Rossi. You were going into Jared Goff. Oh, yeah, Jared Goff yes. being good, looking good. The one thing I will say, though, about hard knocks, I could use a little bit less of Hutch's family, to be honest. I'm going to agree I, with I'm, you. I don't know if this is controversial, no, but yeah, that, probably not. that seems like the most scripted part. Yeah. The, the, the I can't believe he's a lion. Yeah. Or yeah, like his sisters being like, Marcus Mariota yeah. at the same time. <laughs> I, I don't know. The most realistic thing is his dad just not saying anything. Right. That's the most realistic part. But even that, I just, I don't know if they need that much screen time. Like, I don't really care about his family as much, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, showing St. Brown's dad in, like, a shorter stint that is nice. That was more interesting. Hopefully they don't keep showing too much of him. But I like, I like hearing a little bit of the takes from the parents and things like that. But eh, I don't know. It, it was just, it was a bit much. Yeah. Yeah. It was a bit much. And we've seen that in two episodes already. So that's the only gripe that I maybe have. Yeah. Uh let's move on to actual preseason. 
There was a lot of games. Some uh, some guys looked really good. Some guys did not look as good. What was your takeaway from preseason week one? So the the first big thing for everybody was the hype train of Malik Willis is it's going. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm not jumping fully on the train. Obvious, we all knew his talent. Mm-hmm. I predicted he was going to get picked top ten because I thought teams just couldn't resist from taking a talent like that. I was wrong. Teams were actually objective in this draft. They they picked smartly for the most part. But it still stands. His He has a huge arm. He can run all over the field. He's elusive. He's tough. That touchdown run to start the game was very impressive. That deep ball, it he shown, he shown all the glimpses of what he can be yeah. if he puts it all together. Mm-hmm. Now, I, obviously, all the people that are already saying, oh, he's gunning for the starting spot, like, let's calm down. Right. It's possible he could start at some point in the season. Who knows? But yeah, Ryan Tannehill is the guy. Right. I think Tennessee would have to fall apart because they're notably a playoff team. So if if Tannehill was struggling that much, maybe Willis gets a chance. But yeah, I can't see it. But then uh, Kenny Pickett. It was really interesting. Their three quarterback race. It seems like it's basically going to be Trubisky in the one spot, and that's not going to change. But the way Mason Rudolph is kind of being phased out, mm-hmm. even though he's still competing to be the backup, it, it's kind of weird. Like, people barely mention his name. Yeah. Even though it, it's clear once they drafted Kenny Pickett with that first pick, he's going to be more of the objective and more of the plan. Right. But it, it's it's just weird, especially he dropped that dime to George Pickens in the corner of the end zone. George Pickens, another guy who looks like he's going to be a stud. Yeah. The Steelers always draft incredibly well with receivers yeah and now mason rudolph has been rumored to be a trade target for the lions yeah but yeah kenny pickett the way he he played in that second half and the way he finished the game showed everything he has Mm -hmm. and how ready he could be if he plays even though he probably won't be the starter right uh one that uh really showed out for me actually was damian pierce running back for the texans he's looked really good uh it might be unfortunate the texans aren't going to be a very good team uh, but he could quickly, like Marlon Mack is the starter right now for that team. And I think he could very quickly take over that spot if, you know, you just give him the chance. Marlon Mack is good, and I'm curious to actually see what he's going to be like actually coming back off of an injury. Yeah, the, the way his time ended in Indianapolis was pretty strange. Yeah, because people forget, like, he had as a, a rookie, thousand... he, he played great as a rookie and then was like their guy going into his second season. Didn't he have a thousand-yard season? I believe... He did. I, I don't know if it was his rookie. He got close to a thousand. I remember yeah. that he got close to it. Yeah, I can't remember if he hit it. Yeah. So interesting to see what that backfield is going to look like. I think the Texans might surprise a couple people, uh, even with Lovey Smith just being a. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the Texans might be okay. I don't think they're going to be good by any means, but they uh, could win five, just five or six, maybe. Yeah. I like like we've said before, Davis Mills is better than people think. They got Brandon Cooks, who's reliable. Uh, Nico Collins hopefully stays healthy this season. And they got a, a decent amount of running backs that could do something. Rex Burkhead, I think, is still there. Um, but, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm I, trying to think of another I, standout. But. During that Steelers game, on the other side, the Geno Smith and Drew Locke situation, mm-hmm. some people have said in the past few days that it's it's a, it appears that Geno Smith has a lock on it. But Drew Locke looked pretty good in that game. Yeah. I think he went he went like – 11 of, like, 13 or 11 of 14, two touchdowns, no turnovers. He was showing all those glimpses that he showed his first year in Denver. Yeah. And I think I saw a report before we started this that he just had, a like, a lights-out day coming off of that game or a lights-out few days coming off of that game. Yeah. Just He looks like he's confident but, and that he could take it over. But the other thing that came in just before as well, he tested positive for COVID-19. So he will Did miss see that. So he will miss their next preseason game huh. and we'll have to sit out for what five days now. Okay. So he goes from red hot to now he's got to sit out for a little bit. So that it's kind of I don't know. It's time is it a little bit, but yeah, that'll be interesting to see. Um oh another one I think is Brian Robinson running back yeah. for the commanders. A lot of people think Antonio Gibson might not be that guy anymore, which seems crazy to me, but he fumbled Yet again, um, I think in their preseason game. 
and that's kind of been one of his few problems. And they already have J.D. McKissick back as kind of their receiving guy, but a lot of people think that Brian Robinson might start cutting into Antonio Gibson's playing time, which yeah. would be crazy. I mean, coming out of Memphis, Antonio Gibson was already transitioning from more receiver to straight up running back, mm-hmm. and he's shown he has a ton of talent. Yeah, but Brian Robinson has shown he stayed at Bama for three years, waited his turn as a backup, and in his last year, he showed he was a bell cow back. Mm-hmm. Now he's not the fastest, he's not the most elusive, but one guy bringing him down isn't likely. Yeah. He's got the huge size. He's crazy strong. And he has really good game speed. Mm -hmm. And when he hits the hole, he's not a guy that's going to try to bounce it outside and be all type of extra. He's going to hit the hole, find where his lane is, and he's going to go. Yeah. And he's showing that with Washington right now that he he could be the most consistent option. Mm -hmm. Which, coming out of Bama and showing all he showed in that situation, I'm not surprised. Sam Howell also showed some things, too. Yeah. To where he could end up getting some playing time later in the season. Mm-hmm. Even, uh, what's the other one? Oh, Sam Ellinger looked pretty good, too, for the Colts. Just speaking of, like, backup mm-hmm. quarterbacks. That that Bills-Colts game was such a, did you watch any of it? No. That first half, they turned the ball over back and forth, like, four times. Yeah. In the first and second. Like, I, I stopped watching after the first half, so I wouldn't even have known mm-hmm. if Sam Ellinger played well. Right. But it's pretty good. Yeah. Happy for Sam. Um, we do have some breaking news. Um, really? Yeah. LeBron James just signed a two-year, $97 million extension. This is what LeBron does. He's he's a businessman. Crazy. He never signs long extensions, but he gets his money. So he's staying with the Lakers for two more years, which I, I think is kind of interesting, actually, because a lot of people thought maybe he'd uh, maybe be on the way out. But Will LeBron James be a Los Angeles Laker? Maybe. After that dunk, he might be. It's probably not going to happen. But that's we'll talk about Bronny another time. Yeah. Kid's got a bright future. Um, speaking of uh, deals as well, though, Derwin James of the Chargers got a four-year, $76 million yeah. deal. Most pricey deal for a safety in NFL history. Yeah, so he's kind of resetting the market for safeties uh, going forward, which is just, it's just kind of interesting. Yes. If he's healthy, he's a top, maybe top three safety in the league. Yeah. He's definitely top five when he's healthy. Mm-hmm. But he that's the thing. He, he has to play a full 17 games. Yeah. So we'll talk about more preseason next week when we get, you know, another game under our belts. The Lions are going to play the Colts this weekend. Uh, should be interesting to see. I, I like the Colts, actually. They're doing their joint practices all week. Watched a little bit of it. Colts could be really good this season. Matt Ryan might be that guy that they needed. Um, granted, it's just practice. He's been doing it for so long now that he's a vet. But – his connection with like Michael Pittman and all those guys looks really good. They could be terrifying to play at some point. Yeah. Um, so yeah. On to the college football preview. We got the big one. The SEC. The teams that win national champions championships, basically. Yeah. In the past twenty years, no conference has won more. Mm-hmm. That's where the most talent comes from. It's just a breeding ground for – It's it's been known from Florida, that's where you get the speed. Georgia, that's where you get the power. Yeah. And you can go anywhere in the south and find those things. But those particular states, yeah, that's where you get the highest level athletes. And they all come home. They mm-hmm. stay home for the most part. Yep. So let's uh, get right into it, Malik. Let's start with those big teams right at the top. Listen, we we won't spend a long time on these two at the top because we know what they are. Even though they, they got some new stuff coming in and some stuff going out in the draft, mm-hmm. we know what these programs are. Alabama and Georgia. They played in the SEC championship. They played in the national championship. Georgia won the national championship for the first time in a long time. Mm-hmm. Finally got over the hump. And they're back. The predicted one and two once again at the top of the SEC. Bryce Young is back. First Heisman winner at quarterback for Alabama in a very long time. Mm -hmm. On the other side, Stetson Bennett is back. His story is well documented. Walk on, Juco, back to Georgia. And he doesn't have all the talent in the world, but he's consistent, and he he won him the championship. He didn't do it alone. There was a ridiculous all-time amount of talent around him. One of the greatest 
Georgia defense, well, defenses in college football history Georgia had. A lot of those guys are off to the NFL, but they have plenty of guys to replace. Georgia has guys returning in terms of uh, skill talent. They lost a few guys. Actually, a guy from Georgia transferred to Alabama in the offseason, which I don't know if that's seen as being like a traitor <laughs> in the SEC and down south. Probably. They're not really rivals, but it's it's kind of crazy. Jermaine Burton, a guy who was seen as there since George Pickens was kind of unhealthy in his time at Georgia, Jermaine Burton kind of became the number one guy for them over the past year. He transfers from Georgia to Alabama, mm-hmm. released a statement once he transferred saying, everybody shut up. I'm going to do what I have to do. <laughs> I'm going to make my money and put up my numbers. Alabama also has a transfer from the ACC. I brought this guy up a few uh, episodes ago, or last episode actually, for the ACC preview. Jameer Gibbs was one of the best running backs in the country, but because he was at Georgia Tech in a rebuild process, people don't really know. He is going to be the starting running back for Alabama this year. He's going to be a first-round pick, and he's a stud. That's all you need to know about him. Alabama also brings in a transfer from Louisville at receiver, Tyler Harrell. He's a speed guy, averaged over 20 yards per per reception last year. Didn't put up huge stats, but I think he had like over 800 receiving yards and like seven touchdowns. So they got Jermaine Burton and Tyler Harrell in after losing a few guys to the NFL draft. And it's it's business as usual in Alabama. Mm-hmm. What, are, what are you supposed to expect? I, I can't forget Will Anderson on defense, best best player in college football. Yep. Should have been in New York last year. He He's probably going to be the number one pick. Competing with his own teammates to be the number one pick. Exactly. And on the Georgia side, like I said, replacing one of the greatest defenses ever. But they've they recruited high, high, high-level prospects for the past five, six years. Yeah. They probably won't be as dominant, but they're still going to be one of the best in the country. Mm-hmm. They reload at running back every year. They, they've built up their wide receivers. It's yeah. them two clashing at the top again. And just to think, like, they lost their top two running backs. Yes. James Cook and Zamir White, they're both in the NFL now, and they're going to be just fine. Yeah. It's it's just to so much talent, too much talent, if you think about it. It's insane. Mm-hmm. Not much more to say about those two, but they're most likely going to be back in the SEC championship yeah. and might both be back in the playoff, mm-hmm. but there also could be one of them. We'll right. get to that. Next up, I am going to go in the East to start, and I'm going to go with a team that, was really good last year, won 10 games, one of the best teams in Kentucky football history. They've had a great run over the past few years. They're coming back with a quarterback that's getting uh, a lot of hype. A top, bit too much hype. Top five, potentially. Yeah. It's supposed to be a big quarterback draft. Will Levis. You look at his measurables, you look at the talent he has physically, you understand why he has so much hype. Mm-hmm. He's 6'3", 230. He can run. He has a huge arm. And when you when you see him up close, he's he's the proto, he's the prototypical look of a quarterback. Mm-hmm. The size, the the arm talent, and he has the personality. But when you look at the stats, <laughs> I believe last year he threw 24 touchdown passes to about 14 interceptions. 13. 13, yes. Yep. No high level of consistency. Mm-hmm. I mean, he he was new to the team and was adjusting to the off, to the system, and he's in the SEC. But that's a lot of interceptions. Yeah. But yes, he has the running ability. But for all the hype he has, it's a lot to be on his shoulders for this year. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're they're a team that's known for running the ball first and throwing it second. So it would be pretty incredible if he just erupted to like thirty something touchdowns. I expect him to cut down the interceptions now that in his second year at Kentucky in the system. Mark Stoops is one of the most underrated coaches in the country. He's starting to get his credit now yeah, because he's has this Kentucky program rolling after years of being not that great. But a lot of it is going to be on his shoulders. Uh, they have Chris Rodriguez coming back, one of the better running backs in the SEC. Mm-hmm. But he got in trouble over the, over the offseason season. And could be suspended for a few games. I'm not sure if he will or not. Yeah. But he he's a bell cow guy that's going to get a lot of carries. Their receiving core is usually in flux. 
They've never really had a huge go-to guy. Last year, they brought in Wondell Robinson from Nebraska. That th- I think that's going to be their biggest problem this yeah. year is and, that it, he's he had 104 catches, 1,300 yards. The next guy had 41 catches for 600 yeah. yards. They they brought him in to be the go-to threat guy, Yeah, and he was. In terms of catching balls and reverses and stuff out of the backfield, he was their big play threat. Yeah, He was the guy. And replacing him won't be easy. They they don't have an easy fix with him gone. They have some talented guys, a, f- a bunch of guys that were highly recruited out of high school but haven't really emerged yet. There's one guy they've there has a, a lot of camp buzz named Dane Key. Hmm. He's a true freshman receiver out of Kentucky. He is 6'2", almost 200 pounds. He has all the physical stuff. He's not really a deep threat guy. He's more of like a possession receiver, but they they think he can step in and immediately catch like 40, 50 passes for them yeah. as a true freshman. On their defense, they lose Zach Pascal, who was drafted by the Lions. But uh, it seems like they've been able to have a revolving door of just tough, high-level SEC defenders over the past few years. Mm-hmm. Whenever they lose somebody to the NFL, they're able to bring another guy in, and they've recruited very well. They re- recruit better and better each year. So looking at Kentucky, I think they have a bit of a step back this season, a bit of a retool. They beat Miami of Ohio week one. They could lose at Florida week two. Mm-hmm. That'll be an important game. Beat Youngstown State week three. Beat Northern Illinois week four. Then you run off a tough stretch. Yep. You go to Ole Miss. You play Southern uh, South Carolina at home. You play Mississippi State at home. Go to Tennessee. At Missouri should be a win. Against Vanderbilt should be a win. But then you end with Georgia and Louisville. Mm-hmm. They could win eight games. They also could be a 7-5 and five team. I think that middle stretch will be the de- determining factor. What can Will Levis be? Now that all this hype is on his shoulders, I don't know if he's going to erupt into the guy people think he could be with all that potential. Yeah. But off of that 10-win season, I don't expect them to run that back again. I think eight wins at most. Seven wins most likely. Next in the East, I'm going to go to Tennessee who was expected to have a rebuilding season last year, brought in Josh Heupel from Central Florida, a guy that ran an air raid kind of system Mm -hmm. there with Dylan Gabriel. He comes in. I expected him to have a fun offense and a pretty bad defense. Yeah. It honestly ended up being that way, but it was a more successful season than a lot of people expected. Yeah. They end up going 7-5, and I think like 4-4 and in conference. And they make it to a bowl game. They end up losing in a wild game. But it's a lot of positive coming into the season. Mm-hmm. A bit of over-expectation with what they have coming back. But it should be really good with the pieces they have. Now, coming back at quarterback, you have Hendon Hooker. A guy that was a transfer in from Virginia Tech. Him and Joe Milton. I of know. legendary I, fame. I just looked at that roster and I was like, wait a minute. Legendary what? former Michigan fame came into Tennessee last year and actually beat out Hendon Hooker in camp. It's starting to be known in the past few years that like all the quarterbacks that he's battled in these like preseason camps, they say he's incredible. Like in preseason, like learning the system and showing his talent in camp, they say he looks awesome. Now when you get to the games, that's when things get shaky. <laughs> he was very inconsistent in the first few games. Got injured against Pittsburgh week two, and they put in uh, Hendon Hooker, and he never looks back. Mm-hmm. Throws 30 touchdown passes, 31 touchdown passes, and only three interceptions. Superb efficiency. Yes. Even for an air raid system where yeah. the reads are easier, mm-hmm. that is incredibly impressive. And kind of shows in those Virginia Tech years where they were falling off and he was there, he was one of the only things keeping them afloat when they were winning seven, eight games. He came in, and it was a seamless transition for Hendon Hooker. They had a pretty good run game, but not a lot to expect in the air raid system. But they had a young guy in Jabari Small, who was a freshman, actually, rushed for over 700 yards and uh, nine touchdowns. Their receiving core wasn't anything crazy, but they had Valus Jones, who had uh, over 800 yards and seven touchdowns. He got drafted by the Bears. And their big-time uh, target was uh, Cedric Tillman, mm-hmm. who kind of came out of nowhere, wasn't a heralded recruit, 
kind of waited his turn at Tennessee in terms of receivers. Over a thousand yards receiving, twelve touchdowns, seventy something catches. He's six three, like almost two twenty. He's a huge body, mm-hmm. but he has good game speed, good long speed. Can go up and get it. You throw it to him deep, he's most likely to come down with it. That's his strength. Yeah, like deep routes, post routes. Even when you throw it to him short, he's so strong mm-hmm. he can go for ten yards. Yeah. So he's returning. Defense, like I said, wasn't expected to be that great. And ended up being not that great. They have to improve on that side, but with the offense being the way it is, and Hendon Hooker coming back, and Cedric Tillman coming back, Mm -hmm. and a few transfers in they had, they bring in Lynn J. Dixon, who was at Clemson, transferred to West Virginia, and they decided to go from West Virginia to Tennessee over the summer. (laughs) So he'll probably play a lot for Tennessee. Brew McCoy, a guy that was a five-star receiver that went to USC out of California, got into some trouble, hasn't played in two years, Hmm. but he walked into Tennessee with a lot of recruiting hype and a lot of physical talent. Yeah. We'll see if he can fit in. And I trust Hendon Hooker. He's one of the best returning quarterbacks in the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he deserves his hype. I mean, if he can, it's hard to do that again, to be honest. It is. 31 touchdowns to three interceptions at any level is very difficult. Yeah. So if he can keep those efficiency numbers up, even if it's, I don't know, 30 to five to seven, even that's, that's pretty solid, but um, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, he he could have went to the NFL after last season, but he decided to come back for an extra year because he felt this could be a season where they take another step winning eight or nine games. Yeah. And when you look at the schedule, they can win their first four games. Mm-hmm. Ball State, you go to Pittsburgh, but Pittsburgh is going through some changes, like yeah. I said last week. They're ranked, but remember they had a miraculous season basically last yeah. year. Pat Narduzzi is reshaping the offense into what he likes, mm-hmm. more of a balance with passing and running. Tennessee could win at Pittsburgh. Week three, they beat Akron. Week four, Florida at home. Florida's retooling things. Mm-hmm. They can win that game. They can have a 4 0 start. Then you go to LSU week five. Could be a loss. Yep. Could also be a win. I think I'll give it to LSU because that could be 4 and 1. Alabama at home. <laughs> they scored 28 against Alabama last year at Alabama. Mm-hmm. But I, did, I, I don't see it happening yet. I just yeah. don't. They're, Alabama's too strong on defense. Yeah. Too powerful on offense. Another year under loss. the belts. Beat UT Martin. I think they beat Kentucky at home. Lose at Georgia. Beat Missouri. Tennessee-South Carolina game is a toss-up. I'll get to South I mean, I'll get to South Carolina. Beat Vanderbilt at the end of the season. Most likely eight and four. Could be nine and three. Hmm. So the hype could grow even larger if they put together this season that some people expect. And it could happen when you look at the schedule. Yeah. I mean, the Pittsburgh game is a toss-up. The LSU game is a toss-up. Mm-hmm. Kentucky game, some people see as a toss-up, but I think they win that one at home. And South Carolina game, who knows? I think most likely 8-4 and four could be 9-3, and three, which could be a pretty big jump for Tennessee. That could land them second in the East Yeah, behind Georgia. That would be a huge season for Josh Heupel in year two. Hmm. And with the recruiting they're putting together, they're putting together a top-10 class. The hype in Knoxville is growing. So, yeah, good times in Tennessee for now because things always go sideways for, for them. Yep. But should be a pretty pretty good season. Pretty nice step up year two. Could finish second in the East. Good for them. Next up, Florida. They have a new head coach, Billy Napier from Louisiana. Dan Mullen is gone after the mess of last season. Mm-hmm. Things started to fall apart. Players started to quit and the expectations just fell off a cliff. Now, Florida fans didn't know how to feel about the Billy Napier hire in the offseason. If you look at message board stuff, it's been absolutely hilarious because over the past few months, they've been going crazy on him for not recruiting well enough. Mm -hmm. Now Florida is sitting at 10 in the recruiting rankings, so it's not much they can say right now Mm -hmm. because Billy is on fire on the recruiting trail. But when you look at what they'll be this year, 
it really all hinges on what they could get out of a player that a lot of people think could be a superstar. Mm -hmm. Emory Jones is gone. He had his time in Florida over four years. He transferred to Arizona State to get his last year as a starter. This year, it's the era of Anthony Richardson. Mm -hmm. Another potential top five pick. Now, this kid, I believe in the hype. He's got the build. He's 6'4", 230. He's got the running ability and the speed and the power. Mm -hmm. But his arm, it's special. Yeah. It's not fully consistent yet. He's going to be the starter. He has to prove it. But the short glimpses he showed last year when he got his spot times, yeah, he would come into a game the first few seasons. He would get two drives and score two touchdowns, and it would just be like three or four highlight plays. Mm-hmm. And everybody would be like, why is he not starting? Right. But there was a reason why. Mm-hmm. Once he started against LSU once in midseason, he had those plays, but it was clear he still had some weaknesses. Started against Georgia, a few highlight plays, they fall off. There was up and down with Anthony Richardson in his first year getting, like, real time. I believe in his talent, but they have to keep building the roster around him. In terms of receivers, there's a lot of unknowns. They had a lot of transfers. Yeah, a lot of transfers, a lot of guys that could, should live up to their talent, but might not. Mm-hmm. They have a guy, and where where is he? Where is he? Where is he? What's his name? Oh my gosh, uh, Justin Shorter. Mm-hmm. He was the top running top receiver in his class in 2018 or 19, I believe. Went to Penn State, never really played, transferred. Came to Florida, got some playing time. Still hasn't lived up to his physical ability. He's six four, almost two thirty. He runs almost a 4'4". He can jump out the gym. And with that size, shouldn't he be a monster? Yeah. All those all those things together sounds like a monster on paper. Right. But he hasn't figured it out mm-hmm. as a overall receiver. The route running has never been great. The caching has been inconsistent. He has to become the alpha dog for them to be a seven-win team this year. Yeah. Because they, they brought in a transfer from Arizona State named Ricky Pearsall, who was lighting up things in camp but got hurt, and it's supposed to be out six to eight weeks. Yeah. So now they're scrambling for guys that are on the team already and were pretty highly recruited but have no real experience. Mm-hmm. They have some running back talent. One guy I actually really like is running back Montrell Johnson, who transferred over from Louisiana with Billy Napier. As a freshman, he was their top running back at Louisiana. He's a Louisiana kid, had higher offers, but stuck in state and just believed in what Billy Napier was building at Louisiana. Hmm. Follows him to Florida. He's 5'10", over 200 pounds, has speed and power. A lot of talent, should play a lot. They've got some other guys also in the running back room that have a ton of talent but haven't established themselves. You brought up Damian Pierce earlier. He left. Yep. They have another guy that left also. So this Florida team, like I said, is a big retool job for Billy Napier. With Anthony Richardson, you have a high ceiling. But when you look at the schedule, it's, it's not it's not the close to easy. Yeah. Week one, you got Florida at home. I mean, you got Utah at home. Florida plays Utah in the swamp. Utah is ranked number seven in the preseason. Preseason polls don't matter. Yep. But I expect Utah to be the top team in the Pac-12. They're not coming in to take it easy on Florida at all. It could be a disappointing loss to Florida fans, but it wouldn't be a surprise to a lot of people if Utah beat Florida. Right. Week two, you have Kentucky at home. I think Kentucky could – this could be one of their seven or eight wins. But Florida could also get a big win in this one, having it at home. Right. That's two toss, two toss-ups in the first two weeks. The first one, I most likely think it could be Utah. They play South Florida at home week three. That should be a win. Week four at Tennessee, I think that's a loss. Week five at Eastern Washington at home, win. Missouri week six should be a win. LSU week seven, toss up. Mm -hmm. At Georgia, loss. At Texas A&M, loss. South Carolina at home, toss up. At Vanderbilt should be a win. At Florida State, last game of the season, toss up. Mm -hmm. 
you go six and six and go to a ball game this year, it should be looked at as as a success, right? Because that is at least seven or eight toss ups in there, and four like absolute losses. Yeah, and it's gonna it's gonna depend a lot on Anthony Richardson. Yes, and the problem with all that is, like we said earlier, if he plays well, he's gone. So they got to really work on developing these young guys and making sure that they have talent that can keep coming back. Um, but yeah, that should be interesting. Just think because I've already looked at like early 2023 drafts. Yeah. Um, what would you think of Anthony Richardson throwing to Jamison Williams for the Lions? I mean, if he if he balls out this season, yeah. I mean, Florida, there's, if he balls out in Florida, wins like eight games. Yeah, there's a lot to prove. And yeah, if he proves all of it, like if all goes well, honestly, this isn't even crazy to say. If he lives up to his full potential in this season, he should be in New York. Hmm. If he throws for thirty touchdowns, has like eight nine interceptions, and rushes for like over eight hundred yards, mm-hmm. and Florida wins eight or nine games, he could be in New York. Yeah, because that will be unexpected, and his talent will be on full display, and he could have even more impressive numbers than that because his talent is that high. Yeah, I mean it's it's that sounds good. And like I've already said, good. this this quarterback class is getting deeper by the minute. Uh, a lot of people think there's going to be a lot of quarterbacks to go in the top ten, and Anthony Richardson is right up there with them. Yeah. So next up, we're we're gonna speed it up for these last two teams in the East. Yeah. South Carolina, a team that. Wasn't, shouldn't have been, that's what I'll say, shouldn't have been good at all last year. <laughs> but somehow from the sheer charisma and will of Shane Beamer in his first year at coach at South Carolina, mm-hmm. they went 6-6. Six and six. Yeah. No real great or even good quarterback options. Mm-hmm. No consistent options on offense. No stars on defense. And they they go six and six and end up winning a bowl game. They just got it done. Yeah, and that has the South Carolina fan base hyped. <laughs> I have a fa- I have a friend that went to South Carolina that is on the hype train in a major way. And if I was a South Carolina fan, I think I would too. Hmm. That roster, that team was not good, and they won a bowl game last year. And they bring in some talent. They bring in some real talent in both recruiting and mainly the transfer portal this year. They bring in Spencer Rattler. Yep. Last year, he came in with all the hype in the world, the NIL deals, the Heisman hype, and the top 10 NFL draft hype. Within a few weeks, it was clear the spotlight was too bright for him. Mm -hmm. By the halfway point of the Texas game, Caleb Williams took over. And all of Oklahoma shifted to Caleb Williams. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that his confidence dropped. Now, in his time last season, his completion percentage still wasn't bad. It was high 60s, almost 70. Had more touchdowns than interceptions. But it was clear that on a consistent drive-to-drive basis, Spencer Spencer Rattler wasn't getting it done for for Oklahoma. Right. They could have lost in Nebraska. They could have lost several games that they shouldn't have lost. But... I still believe in him. Hmm. He needed an attitude adjustment. He needed to be humbled because even going back to high school, him being ranked as the number one guy gave him more than just confidence. He was on the Netflix show, wasn't he? QB1, yes. He was one of the main guys on QB1 in one of their last seasons. And it was clear that he was cocky. He knew how good he was, and he would tell you about it. And he came into Oklahoma as a freshman, and he lived up to the expectations in that first season when he started as a redshirt freshman. But like I said, last year it just fell off. I think he's been humbled. You listen to him talk now. I think he's learning how to be a leader of men. I think him being under Shane Beamer has taught him some lessons. And with these other transfers they brought in, they also brought in Austin Stogner, also from Oklahoma, Hmm. who was one of the better tight ends in the country when he was healthy. They brought in Antoine Wells, a receiver from James Madison, who's now in the FBS, if people didn't know. They went from FCS to FBS now. Mm -hmm. They're in the Sun Belt. A really good FCS receiver that should come over well. And they also, in terms of running backs, they bring in Christian Beal Smith from Wake Forest. But they also have guys like uh, 
Jewel Lloyd, who's he was one of the top running backs in his class and should live up to his billing this year. Mm-hmm. And Juju McDowell, who was really good as a true freshman last year. They've got the talent on offense to surprise a ton of people. Defense is still building. They have a few guys that were high-level recruits that are on that defense that need to live up to their billing, and they have some young guys that they're mixing in also. Schedule-wise, it's a lot of toss-ups. It's a lot of I don't knows. Like, you beat Georgia State week one, you go to Arkansas week two. I think that's a loss. You play Georgia week three, most likely lost. You play Georgia, I mean, you play Charlotte week four, win. Week six, you go to Kentucky, toss up. You play at home against Texas A&M week seven. I think they could upset Texas A&M. Mm. That could be a big one of the big upsets of the season, Yeah, but who knows. You beat Missouri at home. You beat Vanderbilt on the road. You go to Florida, most likely a loss in my opinion, although it could be a toss up. Mm-hmm. Could beat Tennessee, should lose to Clemson. Another maybe six and six, like Florida. Yeah. And it hinges on the quarterback. But more hope, once again. Yes. Once again, more hope. The offense should be pretty exciting. And I think Spencer Rattler, if Spencer Rattler does what I expect him to do, I think they could be slightly above Florida and go seven and five. Because I think he should be back on the NFL radar after this season. And he could be, end up being a late first round or second round pick. It's all on his shoulders for the most part, mm-hmm. even though they have the talent. Slight upgrade for South Carolina after the first year. Missouri and Vanderbilt. Missouri, they're free, they're uh, they're uh, they're they're in a tough spot. <laughs> they're figuring things out with Eli Drinkowitz. He's recruited extremely well. Mm-hmm. They have the top receiver in the country coming in, and Luther Burton. He's a St. Louis kid that stayed home. He's the number one option from the jump. He's that talented. The quarterback from last year transferred away to Indiana. I mentioned that. I'll mention that next week when I talk about Indiana, that guy. But they have Brady Cook. They named him the starter last week. Mm -hmm. Another St. Louis kid who wasn't one of the most like highly recruited guys in the country, but had some offers from several D1 schools. He has some arm talent but he's young and has to prove a lot. Mm-hmm. They lose Tyler Beatty, who rushed for almost 1,600 yards last year. Yeah. Big piece of their offense. Yeah, I don't know how they replace him. Mm-hmm. It's it's just it's so much youth. Their most talented players are young. Brady Cook is young. He's a sophomore. I don't know if they win six games this year. Yeah. But making a bowl game, if they make a bowl game, that would be huge. But progress shouldn't be seen in them making a bowl game this year. Yeah, because of their youth, having Luther Burden, having Brady Cook, and having a bunch of young pieces that have to prove what they can do in the SEC. Mm-hmm. They have some talent. Eli Drinkowitz is figuring it out, but I think it's most likely four and eight or five and seven with them this year, most likely. Lastly, in the East, Vanderbilt. Listen, they've been one of the teams that have been at the bottom of the SEC and college football overall for the past decade or so. Besides James Franklin having his ups. More of a basketball school. But here's the thing. I'm positive about the future of the Commodores. Head coach Clark Lee, who was a former defensive coordinator at Penn State and played at Vanderbilt in college, mm-hmm. I believe in his his plan and his vision and what he's doing so far. He just brought in one of the best, I think the second best recruiting class in Vanderbilt history. It ranked 32 overall, which was last in the SEC, but it's great for Vanderbilt. Right. A bunch of four – well, not a bunch, but three or four four four-star guys, a few guys that will most likely play. At the end of the day, what they have on the roster right now isn't enough. Mm -hmm. He's got to keep building on this recruiting class and the ones coming in. This first crop of talent he's bringing in has SEC-level talent guys. One guy I'm going to bring up, who you probably won't hear from most places, Jaden McGowan, three-star wide receiver, only 5'8", 170. Hmm. South Carolina kid, they say in spring and in the summer, he's just been lighting it up. He's small, but he's electric. Rondell Moore. You read my mind, sir. Rondell Moore-esque. 
Okay. You get on the ball in open space, and he makes it happen. That's the type of guy Jaden McGowan is. Hmm. Outside of that, they named a starting quarterback going into SEC media days a few weeks ago. Mike Wright, a guy that's, a, I think, a redshirt sophomore. He has a ton of talent. He was almost a four-star coming into Vanderbilt. 6'4", like 210, 215. He has more running talent than passing talent. When he breaks out, it's hard to catch him. But he has a bigger arm. And he can make some impressive throws. But they're, they're tailoring the system around him to fit right. his strengths, mm-hmm. which is what you need to do at Vanderbilt. There's a chance they could start off 3-0. and You go to Hawaii, week zero, 10-30 game. Mm-hmm. They're rebuilding. Elon, week two at home, should be a win. Wake Forest, week three, loss. <laughs> Northern Illinois, week four at Northern Illinois. Toss-up. Rocky Lombardi is back. <laughs> oh, jeez. I forgot. Northern Illinois had a surprise crazy season last year, winning 10 games. Vanderbilt has the talent to beat them. I'm Ooh. calling it 3-1 and one Vanderbilt after September. Let's go. Three win Vandy. Okay, and then they fall apart. And then it's over. <laughs> it, it is bad. But three win Vandy in year two mm-hmm. with him bringing in that talent. If you start off 3-1 and one at Vanderbilt, you, you're doing it. You're making your mark. And your plan is setting in. Yeah. I believe they can start three and one. They could also start two and two. And just be two and ten. Yeah. But because three and one is possible, I'm going to give it to them. I like what Clark Lee is doing. Over to the West. We got a little over ten minutes. Yes. So we got to go quick. Talked about Alabama. Somewhat. <laughs> I'm going to put these three teams together before I get to Texas A&M. Okay. Arkansas. Ole Miss. LSU. These are three teams that could all go eight and four and three teams that could all go six and six. Mm. The middle pack of the SEC West is so talented right, and on the rise, mm-hmm. but not good enough to get to Alabama or cut off Texas A&M in my opinion. Yeah. Arkansas, they bring back KJ Jefferson, one of my personal favorite quarterbacks coming back. Mm-hmm. He had a breakout season for Arkansas last year. Led them in passing and rushing. Yep. 21 touchdowns, only four picks. They did lose Traylon Burks. Yes. They lose Traylon Burks, which is a huge loss. Yeah. But they bring in Jaden Hazelwood from Oklahoma, who was a top receiver in his class. A guy that still has a ton of talent, and when he's healthy, he should be able to live up to it. Another guy, Keytron Jackson, a guy that came in, I think, two years ago. High-level four-star receiver. That should be a really good number two receiver for them. Rocket Sanders. Note his name. A guy that was a true freshman last year, ended up being the starter as the season went on. He's like 6'2", almost like 220. He's fast and he's strong. He's going to be really good. They also brought in transfers on defense. Drew Sanders out of Alabama should be a high-level linebacker or edge rusher. They brought in two DBs from LSU and Mississippi State that have a ton of experience. I love what is happening at Arkansas. I love what Sam Pittman is doing. They could go six and six or eight and four, like I said. Yeah. Next up, LSU. Brian Kelly's in from Notre Dame. Huge shock. Yeah. <laughs> he's he comes into a ton of talent, mm-hmm. and he's his recruiting class he's putting together for next year is already high level. Breaking news from LSU: they had a three man quarterback battle going on between Miles Brennan. Garrett Nussmeyer, who was a freshman last year, who was a highly touted quarterback coming in. Right. And a transfer from Arizona State, Jaden Daniels. Recent news in the past few days, Miles Brennan just quit. Oh, nice. I think they act- they told him he wasn't going to be the starter. Mm. This was his sixth year. He just decided to step away from football. Mm. So it's down to Jaden Daniels and Garrett Nussmeyer. A lot of people expect Jaden Daniels to start the season. Yeah. But Garrett, Snar- Garrett Nussmeyer could end the season. Okay. Because Jaden Daniels has a history of being inconsistent. Right. Back to Arizona State. And Garrett, Nutmile, Garrett Nussmeyer's ceiling as a quarterback is much higher. Mm-hmm. He has the skill to make every throw on the field. He throws a pretty ball and can put it anywhere. And I think he might end up being the starter later in the season. They also have Kayshawn Butte, who might be the best receiver in college this year. Hmm. He was a stud as a freshman, a stud last year. 
and should be a first round pick. On defense, they also have one of the better D lines in, in college football on paper. Now they have to prove it, but they have several guys that could be second, first and second round picks. I don't know if Brian Kelly can get all of all of this out of these guys in year one. Right. I don't know what the adjustment period will be, mm-hmm. but they have the talent on offense. They have the talent on defense. They have it's re- LSU. They do have to replace Terry and David Pri- Davis Price though. Yes, as well. But they have some talent to maybe pick up what he left off. Mm-hmm. It's all an adjustment period. Could go eight and four. Could go six and six. Gotcha. Next up, Ole Miss. Lane Kiffin. Matt Corral is gone. Got picked by the Panthers. It's a quarterback battle between two guys. And give me a second. (laughs) I'm forgetting the name of the guy that transferred in from USC. Jackson Dart. Okay. It is a battle between Jackson Dart and a guy that ended up starting in the bowl game last year because Matt Corral got hurt. Luke Altmaier, Mm -hmm. Mississippi kid, been in the program for a few years. Yeah. Nobody knows who's going to be the starter. But a lot of people are confident that either one of them could have them playing pretty good football Mm -hmm. throughout the season. Jackson Dart has more arm talent. Luke Altmaier is more uh, talented going outside of the pocket Mm -hmm. and making plays. I have confidence in both guys, honestly. Yeah. Now, where the real talent comes in is the transfers. They got crowned as the so-called transfer champions (laughs) in the offseason because they just brought in so much. Jalen Robinson, a a receiver from UCF who's very talented. Malik Heath, a transfer from Mississippi State, coming over to Ole Miss. A big-body guy that can be a red zone guy or possession receiver. Michael Trigg, who came over from USC with Jackson Dart, he's expected to be one of the top tight ends in the country. He has high, high, high high-level talent. Receiver level talent in a tight end's body. Yeah. Look out for Michael Trigg. And the big name, Zach Evans. Mm. Running back from TCU. He was a five star kid out of Texas that had a bunch of personal problems coming out. Went to TCU at the last minute, averaged over six yards a carry his two years at TCU, but never hit over a thousand yards because things were just up and down at TCU. Yeah. Now he comes in and they're saying he's already the best player on the offense. Mm. Zach Evans is most likely going to live up to his five-star billing. He has all the speed, the elusiveness, the cutting ability. He's that level of a guy. They're still figuring out the defense. Yeah. They've recruited some talent, but it's mostly going to be led by the offense. Their schedule isn't the easiest. It starts pretty easy, though. Yeah, starts easy with Troy and Central Arkansas and Georgia Tech on the road. Tulsa won't be easy. You got Kentucky, you got Vanderbilt. Then Auburn, LSU, Texas A&M, Ole Miss, Arkansas, Mississippi State. That last six games, mm-hmm. eight and four it's or the S- six and six. It's the SEC. What do you think is going to happen? Listen, man, those three teams, I can't – I'll personally pick Arkansas because I like K.J. Jefferson and Sam Pittman and what they're building, but I just can't pick it. Yeah. I don't know. Next up, Mississippi State. Mike Leach is back. His attitude and his personality are all over the place. Yeah. Some people love him. Some people hate him. Right now in Mississippi State, they kind of like him. He's lost some games to Ole Miss. Mm-hmm. They've had some ups and downs. They've lived up to expectations and bottomed out at certain points. Yeah. They return one of the most unknown but better quarterbacks in the country, mm-hmm. Will Rogers, a guy who came in as an unheralded recruit out of Mississippi, played behind a guy – his first year, but ended up starting the rest of the season as a true freshman. Last year, 36 touchdowns, 9 interceptions. 73% completion rating. And that's on 4,700 yards. Yes, this is in the air raid offense. Mm -hmm. This kid, was he was born to play in the air raid. Mm -hmm. He has unbelievable touch on his passes. He has a pretty deep ball. Wherever you need him to place it in the air raid, He's going to make the read, and he's going to put it where it needs to be. They have offense. They have returning talent. Jaquavius Marks is a quality running back, but he plays in the air raid, right. so he won't get that much praise. Mm-hmm. They lost Makai Polk to yep. the draft, but Mike Leach has recruited well enough and done well enough in the transfer portal to replenish in terms of transfers. 
They lose Charles Cross, who was their top offensive lineman. Got drafted by Seattle, I believe, in the first, in the top ten. Yes. Replenishing that offensive line won't be easy and losing a guy like that, but they have the SEC talent. They have SEC talent on defense also. Their defense was solid last year. They're hoping to improve. They have some pretty good guys. I expect them to be around six or seven wins, but they also, I don't know. <laughs> if the, if Will Rogers just takes that next step and he's destroying everybody in the air raid, they could knock off some teams. Right. But I expect most likely six or seven. Texas A&M. A ton of hype going into this season. Jimbo Fisher expecting to finally make some type of run. They have a quarterback battle between Haynes King, who was a five-star guy coming into Texas A&M, won the quarterback job last year but then got hurt, Mm -hmm. and Zach Calzada played the rest of the season. They upset Alabama with Zach Calzada because of how talented the team is and how stacked they are. But Zach Calzada transferred away to Auburn, and in came Max Johnson from LSU, a guy who was pretty good at LSU but didn't live up to expectations of fans. Right. Him and Max Johnson are battling. Most people expect Haynes King to win the job again. They just brought in the most highly touted recruiting class in like recruiting service history. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense how stacked it is. <laughs> They're going to have experience and youth that can both just go nuts on defense yeah. in the SEC. A guy that I'll note, top player in the country last year, Walter Nolan, out of Tennessee. He can play defensive tackle or defensive end, and that's at 6'4", over 300. At that size, he's agile and fast and has as much strength. He's just an absolute monster. He's going to play a lot for them on defense, even with them having experience. The thing with them is they have to figure out explosive offense. Mm-hmm. They haven't figured it out under Jim Fisher. His offenses are so complex and like NFL level yeah. that he expects his college-level quarterbacks to just go like this read, this read, this read. Okay, I might hit the deep pass here. You got to open up the offense in college. Mm-hmm. The rest of the SEC is, the rest of college is. You got to hit big plays. You got to take advantage of the talent you've recruited. And he's recruited talent. Yeah. One of those guys he's brought in, true freshman Evan Stort. He's expected to start from the jump. And he's he's got everything you need. Speed, jumping ability. He's got the catching radius. He has it all. But what will Jimbo Fisher do with him? Right. His returning receivers last year don't have over 300 receiving yards. And that's mostly on Jimbo Fisher. Mm -hmm. He has to figure out how to get explosion out of this offense with the talent he has. It's all there. I mean, you lose Isaiah Spiller, but you bring back Devin A. Chain, right. who's just a speed demon at running back. Mm-hmm. Top retur- one of the top returners honestly, in the country. Played better than Spiller at times. Yes. He's only like 5'9", like 190-something. Mm-hmm. But when he hits a hole, he's almost gone. Right. Almost every time. He's ridiculous. They have the talent to win 10 games and try to challenge Alabama, but I still think it's not their year. Yeah. The schedule isn't easy. But, like I said, with the talent, they should be at least 9-3, and three, most likely 10-2. and two. Their fans want them to challenge Alabama and get to the SEC championship. I don't expect Jimbo Fisher to completely just open it and have a crazy explosive offense yet. So I think Alabama ends up getting there along with Georgia. Lastly, in the West, Auburn. Go Tigers. Brian Harson has, has been perennially on the hot seat ever since he got there. Mm-hmm. They got a quarterback battle of guys that nobody in the Auburn fan base is excited about. Yeah. Zach Calzada is there from Texas A&M, like I said, but he's solid at best. Mm -hmm. CJ Finley returns. He's got all the physical talent. He's 6'6", like 230. Yeah. But his inconsistency scares everybody. Mm -hmm. Robbie Ashford came in from Oregon. He's a scrambler. He probably won't play much. Bringing back Tank Bigsby was huge. Mm Mm-hmm. He went into the transfer portal but came back. He's going to do what he does. He's an NFL-level running back. Yeah, Their receiver options are up in the air. They've got some talent, but it's a bunch of unknown. Yeah. They have a very talented defense. Some guys returning mm-hmm. and a bunch of guys they've recruited that can live up to it. Yeah. This, t- this team should be led by defense for the most part. If things go right, they should win six games and get to a bowl. But I, I just can't trust their quarterback situation. I don't know who's going to stand out as a receiver. 
I trust Tank's Big, Tank Bigsby and their defense, but I just don't trust them to make any real type of challenge in the West. They're most likely last. Hmm. Alabama and Georgia are back, guys. Surprise, surprise. Wow. And Alabama ranked number one overall once again. Yes. Big surprise. Arkansas is my personal team in the SEC. Okay. I hope they surprise and win not in like nine games. Yeah. But it's it's so tough. In that division, it's just too tough. And I'll tell you, I could care less about the SEC, except for maybe Anthony Richardson. I am I am curious about that. Um you got to watch Bryce Young. He's going to be a top three pick most likely. Oh, I kind of know what he's I, – I, You know what he is? I know what he is, I think. So, I'm interested to see Anthony Richardson. Again, I'm hoping the Lions will go for a quarterback, so that's what I'm looking out for. Next week, it's the Big Ten, baby. It's Michigan, about time. Michigan State. Listen, we, we, we can't talk anything else next week. No. Just – uh, but just Michigan and Michigan State alone. What, we'll probably mention hard knocks really quickly. Yeah. But we won't go over preseason. We're getting right Unless into the Unless there's any 10. huge breaking news. Yeah. So that way we can focus on Michigan, Michigan State especially. Uh, of course, I have to talk about Ohio State. But, um, yeah. Big Ten is next week. This has been Views from the Sidelines. We'll see you guys next time. Detroit Lions quarterback Will Levis. How do you feel about that, Joey? As long as he plays better than golf. I don't even know if that would happen.